Again, welcome to basically we're doing chapter seven today. And uh, uh, just from the get go, I think it's a good idea for you guys to subscribe to the channel because I'm having difficulty basically with the uh, communication between Google and, uh, and Canvas at this point. So that I'm talking mainly to not you guys, to the people who are actually uh, watching this thing later because it takes a long time for them to, uh, for the video to be available. Um, sometimes several hours before it's available. But if you do subscribe, if they do subscribe, that would be much e much faster for them to access this content. Anyway, uh, today the topic is chapter seven. Unless you guys have a question, and it's uh, about the energy. So let me find where that uh, presentation is. Here. So today, uh, again, like I said, today's topic is energy. And that question that I asked a long time ago is still lingering. So what is the motivation behind the concept of energy? Here is basically the answer in a nutshell, okay? We know forces change motion. That's what we learn from F equals to MA mainly, which is the second law of Newton. F equals to MA states that that's how forces change motion. They give it an acceleration. What an acceleration is, is basically is change in either direction or magnitude of the velocity. So that we know for a fact, basically, that what we have established, we grant uh, the three laws of Newton, all of them working together to help, uh, to help us basically understand any problem in physics, mechanics to be more specific. So the question now, I know we asked the, or another question the other day, and that is a situation where things have masses that do change, which allowed us to proceed with the momentum, but we need another motivation for today, and here is the question. Granted, forces change motion, namely F equals to MA. Let me find where my pen is, here it is. And... So granted F equals to MA, I'm going to grant you that. That is given, okay? We're going to work with that. We have an object, let's say, for example, initially was in some position uh, in space, with that has its own velocity at that point. And we apply forces on it, namely F, okay? And the object, we check on it later on in the future, long time after, we find the object has moved to a new location in space. It's no longer where it was before, and it's now in a different location in space, probably with also different velocity. It may or may not be moving, doesn't matter. The point being is the force uh, changed its current state to a future location in, 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 uh, in space so that it has a new location and it also has a new velocity potentially. We're saying in here, in this case, is the force that caused that, that we know. And if we inspect the object anywhere between through this path, we're going to say F equals to MA, any stage of the game F equals to MA. At that instant itself, the velocity changes per this law, because we said that the force is the one that caused it to move from one location to the other. So if we do this question, and basically this analysis, and ask you the, que and ask the following question, how does the force do it? So that's what we're trying to understand today. Yes, we know it changes motion. That is granted. That is F equals to MA, we know that. But we want to know the secret behind its, its, its trick, basically. How does it do it? So the question is, how does the force change motion? That is the question to it. And the answer is this chapter. This is basically the answer to it. It's in this uh, thing. Okay. Here is the answer to the question of how the force do, does change motion. The force will do work in such a way that that work is the change in the kinetic energy of uh, the object. Meaning, when it started at some location in space, it has a position and it has a velocity. We're going to define also another quantity related to that velocity, which is the kinetic energy, which is just proportional to the speed. 
squared because when you square quantity, it doesn't matter now the direction. So this is, has to do with speed. This is what we call the kinetic energy of the object. Now, when it has moved to a new location, it has acquired, it's probably with a different velocity. So the new kinetic energy, so this is initial. This is how much it had. When it reached the new point, it had the same value, one half of m times now the new velocity squared. We call that, I'm sorry, Ke2, not, uh, what did I write in there? So I'm gonna call it kinetic energy two. This is kinetic energy one, okay? That's the symbol for it, kinetic energy one, when it started from. So what the work energy theorem says is the following. The force will do work. That is how this thing is happening. That is how the force does it's what it does. In such a way that this work in taking the object from one location to the other is the difference between these two quantities, namely the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy is the work of this force. So that answers that question. This is what really is happening in this chapter. So we said, okay, the three laws of Newton are granted, including especially the second law, which we're going to base the argument on it. And today, the question was, what is the secret of the force? How does the force do what it does? I mean, how does the force do what it normally does, which is change motion? Change motion on a small scale, if you wish, on an on a infinitesimal amount of time. But we're not interested in an infinitesimal amount of time. We're not interested in the instantaneous effects of the force, which is changing motion. We're interested in a big scale. The big scale, the answer to it in this so-called work energy theorem. We have to understand what the concept of energy is. That is basically what we do. We have to do to get to that point. We have to understand the concept of work. It turns out, because those are both of them involved in the so-called work energy theorem, it turns out there is another quantity in between that we will need, and that is the concept of power. Power is not work. Power is the rate at which work is delivered. So I could do the same work. If for example, I'm tasked to carry, for example, 10, or let's say, for example, make it more interesting. If I'm tasked to carry, for example, 50 pounds through a flight of stairs, uh, I can do it. If given enough time, I can take the whole day, basically, inch by inch by inch until I get it to the second uh, story. But somebody else who is much younger than I and probably more strong can carry the whole thing and probably do it in a minute. So somebody has more power than the other. Both of them did the same amount of work, by the way. Both of them carried the 50 pounds from one flight of stairs. Both of them went from the first floor to the second floor. So both of them spent the same amount of time. But one of them claims more powerful than the other because he or she took less time to do the same work. And that is where the concept of power comes in. So we will need the concept of power. So power is the rate at which work is delivered. Then we will introduce basically the two kinds of energies that we deal with on a regular basis, namely the potential energy and the kinetic energy. I just defined what the kinetic energy is. The potential energy is energy that has to do with the location. I say, for example, this object in here, if I move it up, now it has potential energy. How do I know that? If I let go of it, it's going to convert that potential energy to a kinetic energy. So there is a one-to-one -one connection between the kinetic and the potential. One can change to the other, okay? Potential can go to kinetic, and kinetic can go to potential. There is an interaction. One of them is, a, is an energy of motion, let's say kinetic energy, and the other one is an energy of position, okay? It has to do with the specific distribution. In addition to that, there is a nasty, two nasty forms of energies that are involved that we don't understand very well. One of them is the, the, the friction, and uh, for example, which, is, uh, which wastes energy all the time, it drains the energy from the system. So that's called the dissipative uh, form of energy. And then in addition, there is, an, uh, there is an additive energy that pumps energy to the system like an engine or a motor. That is actually an external non-mechanical form of energy. Both of them are non-conservative. The beauty of these two, they can last forever, basically. They exchange from one to the other, and they're much easier to deal with when we're dealing with physical problems. 
after that, we're going to talk about the conservation of energy after talking about the work energy theorem. The work energy theorem turned out to be a critical, one of the most fundamental theorems in physics. As a matter of fact, this one is the same thing as saying F equals to MA. If you can't remember F equals to MA, then remember the work energy theorem. The, it is equivalent to F equals to MA. As a matter of fact, it's so powerful that you can solve any problem in physics just if you know it. But it's a little bit cumbersome to do things with sometimes. Uh, that's probably where you refer back to F equals to MA. On other instances, as a matter of fact, it's the other way around. It's much easier to solve problems using the work energy theorem rather than working with the F equals to MA. A corollary of your theorem, if you wish, or a subsidiary or something that derives off of it is the conservation of energy. As I stated earlier, uh, when a force derives from a potential, it comes from a potential, the energy is conserved. We're in good shape. Like, for example, force of gravity is conserved quantity, okay? That's one of the concepts that we deal with. The force on a spring, for example, is a conserved quantity, so that's, that's fine. So in this case, we have conservation of energy. Spring can go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, forever and ever, if we neglect friction. If friction doesn't exist, of course, friction drains energy from the system. Or it can go faster if somebody is actually moving it around, if some, somebody's pumping energy to it, or there is an engine behind it. Those two forms are non-conservative, so those are outside of the realm. Talk about simple machines. Simple machines, there are six of them, probably we'll mention a couple in here. Namely, I think the pulley and the lever, but there are more than that. There is the wedge, there is the incline, there is the, the gear, and also we have the, uh, I mentioned already the pulley, which changes the direction of force, and we will see the significance of what simple machines are. Simple machines, basically, all machines, you can break them down into one of this or a combination of. Compound machines are made up of simple machines. Again, their purpose is just to change the effort so that you will have less effort to, do, to, to work on the load. But they don't create energy. Energy, at best, the output is the same as the input. This is at best. If friction is neg neglected, if friction is, uh, is present, if dissipative forces are present, which they are, are, always are, the output energy is usually less than the input energy, okay? And this is true for any machine, doesn't matter, simple or compound or complex, okay? Talk about the efficiency of the machine and that's specifically related to the last point. How efficient is the machine is? How much basically output you get out of it for a same input, okay? We'll talk a little bit after that on sources of energy and things like that. So this is a chapter in that chat. So the motivation for this chapter is to answer the following question. What is the secret of the force. How does the force do it? And the answer is the work energy theorem. Are we clear on that? So the question was for today, this is question one, how does the force do it? In other words, what is the secret of the force? The answer is the work energy theorem, okay? The force does work to change the kinetic energy. So this is question one for you today, okay? Is everybody on board for the discussion today? Okay, very good. So you have the answers, and it's actually one of the bulleted points that you guys have in the, uh, in the, uh, the discussion, it's one of the slides actually, okay? So that's the whole thing in here. Okay, very good, everybody seems to be on board. So the concept of energy. Energy is a combination of energy and matter make up the universe. Basically there are two things in the universe, okay? Uh, matter as we know it, both uh, uh, matter as we see it, and the so-called dark matter, I don't know if we will have a chance to get into it or not, those are both forms of matter, material objects. And then there is energy. And again, there is dark energy to go with it, okay? Mr. Einstein came up with a formula, and that's for later on, we probably are going to uh, talk about it, where he says both of them are the same thing. The C squared actually is a constant. It's just a number, okay? The C is just the speed of light. So matter, which is a mass, and energy is energy. So 
So barring that formula, which at this point we don't know and we don't understand, we have two. Somebody might know from this formula and say, wait a minute, these two are actually one thing, which is true. But we're not going to use that, okay? We're going to just stick with two kinds of forms of uh, stuff in the universe, if you wish. Well, energy is, I mean, matter is substantive. You can make this mass and you can see it. Energy, you cannot see it. But it behaves in the same fashion as anything else, any other concept in physics. You can measure it and you can basically manipulate it. And it goes from one, for one form to the other, okay? Energy is basically everything that has to do with motion. It has to do with position. It has to do with velocity. It has to do with all of the other things. And you can actually quantify it. Case and point. Almost every one of you, and I suspect everyone, this is not almost because you must be online, so you must have some sort of an electronic device at home. You plug that device in the wall. The wall provides energy to your device, okay? That is actually potential energy. That energy is sitting there waiting for you or your device to be plugged in. That energy is in volts, of course. Uh, uh, and how long you use it, that is actually the amount of energy you consume. Just the fact that it's sitting in there doesn't mean that you're going to be billed by the company, although they bill you for service, but technically they shouldn't. You are not consuming energy. But the minute you turn on the light or you plug your device, at that point you're consuming energy. So in, in which case that is converting it to basically whatever you have. So you have 120 volts in your house basically on average. Okay. Energy can be noticed when it's transferred, okay? And it is a conserved quantity throughout the universe. We believe that whatever the universe had in terms of energy to begin with, there is no way you can create energy or, or destroy energy. Somebody might argue, how about this E equal to MC squared? Taken in that context, then both of them, the mass and the energy as a one unit, then they are conserved, okay? It's still conserved quantity. For our physical problems, the ones that we're doing in physics uh, 10, namely the fact that we're doing mechanics, this expression gives you nothing, okay? This does not apply to our case at all. So even if somebody wants to do this, they will get insignificant contributions to the processes that are involved. When an object from one side falls, for example, on an incline, the amount of energy converted to a mass is going to be completely completely insignificant. So that's why this expression, ignore it for a moment. We will deal it with it when we're dealing with supermassive objects in the universe, like black holes or the sun and things like that, or when we're dealing, for example, with the objects that are moving super fast. So at this point, like I said, ignore this expression doesn't mean anything for you guys. There are two kinds of objects in the universe, energy, which does not change, which we cannot weigh it, but we can measure it, we can transform it, and it can be, and it's a conserved quantity just as much as inertia was when we dealt with it. Is this clear? Yes? Oh man, I can see the chats when they're. Okay, very good. Isaac at least agrees with me. Thank you. And Jeffrey now. Everybody, yes, good. <laughs> so. So energy is basically how it shows itself in terms of work for us, basically. You can convert it to work. Work and energy are related, but they are not the same. They are actually measured to the same unit. The difference, for example, in the kinetic energy can be, can be, uh, can be uh, 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 measured in terms of work. Actually, it can be work. The difference of potential energy can be work, okay? The difference between any two energies can be work. That's basically the bottom line. Okay, so anything can be turned into heat, electromagnetic waves, for, exa for example, from the sun, matter, substance we can see, smell, and feel occupy space. So that's the difference between matter and, and, uh, and energy in this case, okay? So energy can be, you can convert it to work or get heat out of it. Heat, for example, you can do work with it. I mean, think about the, uh, the old uh, heat engines, basically, that, uh, and I think steam engines still are running in some places too, okay? So those, they use heat. As a matter of fact, the car engine uses heat too, okay? It takes energy from chemical reactions of the burning of the fuel and basically starts the uh, pressure that is basically pushes the, uh, and the pressure is coming from the heat that is generated from that chemical reaction inside the, uh, 
inside the pistons and the pistons turn the flywheel and the flywheel basically turn the tires and the tires press on the road and the car moves. So that's basically how the car works. Okay. So work involves displacement. Work, the formula for work is force times displacement, not distance, displacement, okay? So this is really what it is. I know it says in here distance, distance traveled if you wish, okay? So assume that there is a force that dragged an object over a certain distance, okay? So this is D, this is the force. Multiply both of them and you get the work. You have to remember something. Work is not a vector. Work is a number, is a scalar. This is a scalar. The force is a vector. It has direction. Which way you push or pull, that has direction. The displacement also has direction, which is vector. You have a vector times vector becomes a scalar, becomes a number. So that is a new kinds of operation on vectors that we have not seen at this point, And it's called actually the scalar product of two vectors, okay? In general, what this amounts to, if the force is not in the same direction, so you take the components of the force. So this is D, this is the force. You take this component only of the force, okay? You don't take the entire value of the force. You take its component along the direction. And that's basically how you find the, uh, the, uh, the work. For example, a force that is perpendicular in the direction has no component in here. So this should have no work. Okay, the work is zero in that case. That's basically something in here. So it's really the component of the force along the displacement. Let me write it down in here. Two things occur, application of force movement on an object. So let me write the key word in here. It's actually, oops, what happened to this pen in here? So this is the component. I know when we talked about uh, vectors the other day, that is what is meant. Not the exact force, it's component. Like for example, this case, the component of the force is there, is, and the force is there, and the displacement is there. But this force has no work because it has zero components along the direction of motion. That's a key concept in here that is sometimes uh, uh, not clear. Which means that an object that moves on the on the uh, on the horizontal direction, for example, on the desk, the gravity doesn't do work in this case because it's moving horizontally and gravity is pointing down. So in this case, gravity doesn't do work. It's your hand that is do wor doing work against the uh, friction or something. That's just something else. But the point in here, gravity force of gravity does not do work when you're moving on the plane. When you climb, though, you do work. That's why when I gave my original example about uh, carrying 50 pounds and going once, uh, when basically from a floor to floor, then you do work. But if you're going just on the side in here carrying 50 pounds, you're not, gravity is not doing work, actually. You may be doing work against something else, but not against force of gravity. I mean, there is an effort. Carrying 50 pounds needs an effort, too. But no work, okay? The work is measured in joules. So the unit, oh man, this, this whole thing is, is there a clear button in here somewhere? Okay, never mind then. Let's go to the next slide. So the work has this unit in honor of Mr. Jewel, who did a lot of things for us related to heat and the energy and work. So they honored him with this unit. If you push against stationary brick wall for several minutes, you do no work on the wall at all or uh, both of the above. Of course, the wall is not moving, so there is no work on the wall. But do you do work at all? Well, in this case, case probably you are doing because you have to exert forces on yourself and move or muscles or something like that or other kinds of energy transformations. Okay, not mechanical form of energy, basically muscles. So the correct answer that we know based on the definitions that we have is just this. Again, the work is proportional to the amount of 
of uh, force in this case because you're lifting an object from this height to this height. So that is the height that you're going to. This is a displacement. That's what goes into D. And what goes in the force is the weight, which is mass times gravity for this object. Now you double the mass, you double the work, okay? This is actually a simple machine. The pulley is a simple machine. The pulley changes direction of the force. So instead of actually lifting the weight and pulling it up and doing work this way, you pull on it, okay? And it's the same amount of work. So in this case, actually, we're, we're a little bit ahead of uh, the last section of this chapter, but that's basically what it is. So you're doing work using a simple machine in this case, which is a pulley, and the pulley actually changes the direction of the, uh, of the, uh, of the force, okay? The amount of work, whether you lift the object, let's call this distance, for example, it's about three times this person, about three meters, okay? So you're lifting the object three meters, you will do the work whether you lift it straight out, this guy does it, or the other guy pull on it, it's the same thing. But in this case, the simple machine, which is a pulley, redirects the, 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 the direction of the force. So instead of pulling on it upward, you're going to pull it downward, okay? So when you double the force, distance is twice as great. So twice as much work is done in lifting two pounds, two stories. So if you lift it up, so again, that's just the same thing in here. If you double the distance, but keep the weight the same, it's the, uh, it's the same amount of work, okay? So basically this is the basic formula, FD. You double this, the work doubles. You double that, the work doubles. You double both the work quadruples, okay? This is simple enough. Okay, I already mentioned the uh, unit for work. It's a joule. It's a Newton times meter because force is in Newton and, uh, and the uh, distance is in, or displacement is in meters. So Newton meter is the unit, but people gave it again a name in honor of Mr. Joule. This, this unit, which is J okay, for joule. So the weightlifter in this case is doing work because the weightlifter is lifting the weight for over a certain distance. Therefore, that, that weight times the displacement is going to be the work that the weightlifter is going to be doing. I mean, it's a tongue twister. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's kind of an easy question, isn't it, guys? Work is done in lifting a barbell. How much work is done in lifting a barbell twice as heavy? The same distance. So F times D, you double this number, basically. The distance doesn't change, okay? Okay, yes, so it's a doubles, that's, that's easy. It's easy stuff, isn't it? You do work when pushing a cart with a constant force. If you push the cart twice as far, then the work you do is, again, now you double the distance. So it should be twice too, isn't it? <laughs> I hope so too, Jacqueline. <laughs> okay. By the way, those homework problems, they will be very critical for you guys. So you really need to take care of them as much as you can because they are going to serve as your preparation for the exams. Okay. So you need to know how things. If you have difficulty with them, please let me know, okay? In other words, the exam is not going to be multiple choice questions because if we do that way, we're going to have probably a thousand questions to prepare from. Sure, sure. Taryn, if you can share, if you are going to ask question, please, about homework problem, please do ask it in the discussion or, I mean, in class, okay? That way, everybody benefits from the question. Do not send an email or send a message. That way, I mean, the conversation stays between the two of us, and maybe two or more other people have, are having the same question. So it's a good idea to ask a question in the discussion, okay? 
that way when we insert it we no okay ways if it is it's going to be based again on those questions that uh, the type of question that we have okay so again michelle and everybody who have questions about the uh, the uh, the homework it's a good idea to ask them in the discussion okay that way uh, if I'm not around to answer it, maybe somebody else enter, enter, uh, answers it. And please do answer it if you think that you, uh, you know how to do it so that we don't have to wait for a long time for an answer to come around, okay? So uh, that's really part of the whole thing for the discussion things, okay? And, uh, and everybody else also benefits from the answer to those questions. And before we do the actual exam, we're going to go through a review process so that you guys have everything answered. We sit together and actually and work these things together, hopefully, and answer everything before the exam. Does this make sense to you guys? Okay, good. So, so twice. Okay, again, I gave the example for the power, the power already between... Uh, me, for example, uh, and Kyle, okay, we're carrying 50 pounds. It takes me probably four hours to do the work, whereas Kyle takes him probably, what, maybe 10 minutes. So one of us is more powerful than the other, and the less time you have, the more power you have. So in this case, I take 50 pounds. It's the same three, fl three meters flight, basically. So the work is the same. So if you're interested in to, uh, work, uh, work so this is going to be in kilograms so it's going to be 25 kilograms times 10 times 3 so for us that's going to be 250 times 3 so it's 750 joules both of us will dispense of 750 joules okay if it takes me an hour to do the work so in this case i say it takes me 750 divided by 60 minutes times 60 seconds so you can do the math basically 750 divided by 3600, 3, it's going to be barely half a, half a watt, or is it less than, no, 0. 0.5 watts, not even half. 750 divided by 3600, no, actually more, I'm sorry. What is the, not showing, where is my calculator? Can anybody do the math quickly for us in here? I'm not showing the 7. 50 by 3600. Yeah, 0.2 watts. Okay, the unit for the uh, for the uh, for the power is watt. Okay, whereas Kyle does the same thing. For example, in 10 minutes. Okay, so it's going to be 750 divided by 10 minutes times 60, because there is 60 seconds in a minute. Okay. So in this case, the power Kyle delivers is going to be, oh man, it's still small, but it's a lot bigger than I do, okay? <laughs> 750 divided by 60, no, 600. So it's 1.25 uh, watts, okay? So there is definitely more power, okay? In the second case and the first case. You guys understand the math behind it? Very simple, isn't it? Force times displacement, I said that I'm carrying 50 pounds, which is roughly about 25 kilos, times 10. Don't forget that 10, that is 9.8 that Mr. Galileo has measured for us. Okay? That gives you the weight. That gives you the force. And you're taking it through a flight of stairs, which is roughly about 3 meters. Okay? So 3 times 250 is 750 joules. Both of us will dispense of 750 joules. So if we're paid on the work, then both of us should get paid the same amount of money, okay? But if one of us takes him an hour, whereas the other one only 10 minutes, there is definitely difference in here in terms of power. That is where the power comes in. So although the work is the same, now the time matters, okay? Now, if we do the example backward and say, for example, let me erase these things, all of them. Can I do this? Yeah. Let me give the same example. Oh man, this is gonna be a long time. Let me give a different example in here to see the argument backward. Let's say for example, we're tasked to do the job in 10 minutes, both of us, okay? 
and we're allowed to break down it's potatoes okay so we're allowed to take how many we can okay in 10 minutes I was able to take the equivalent, for example, of a pound, which is 0.5 kilogram, over that same distance. That's what a pound is, about half a kilogram. Whereas Kyle took, for example, five kilograms, okay, which is about 10 pounds in 10 minutes. So in this case, again, you multiply 0.5 by 10 times the three meters. So 0.5 times 10 is five times three, that's 15 joules, okay? Whereas Kyle did five kilograms times 10 times three, so it's gonna be 150 joules. So for the same 10 minutes, one of us did more work than the other. So it's still the same thing. It's still this, whether we do the same work, one of us takes less time, it's more powerful, or for the same time, one of us does more work, it's more power. Do you guys understand what this expression means then? Power is work over time, okay? Either more work for the same time or less time for the same work. Does it make sense to you guys? Okay, very good. So that's basically what you do, actually, if you go to Walmart and buy a light bulb, and the light bulb says 60 watts, that is the power it's going to, have to consume, okay? or a 100 watt light bulb, that is the power that light bulb will consume, okay? That means every second, it's going to take 100 joules from the power company, okay? So if you let the light bulb lighting for about, let's say for example, an hour, that means 100 times 60, times 60, that means 36 what? 36,000 joules have already been consumed by that 100 light bulb over in, uh, the span of one hour, okay? And that is coming from the Hoover Dam, actually, in terms of power. So that makes the Hoover Dam go cranking to deliver that power to your house, to give you that much hour, okay? So the moral of the story is get the 60 watts because the 60 watts will get the same thing in here, the six times 3,600, what should be, oh, I'm sorry, did I make the math? Oh, they made a mistake. It's not 3,600, it's 360 watts, 360,000 joules, I'm sorry. So you do the math and you will see that the 60 watts will do, the, uh, will do a lot less, okay? So a worker uses more power running up and down the stairs, climbs the same stairs slowly, then climbing it slowly, okay? So time matters. Twice the power of an engine can do twice the work of an engine in the same amount of time. I gave the example, basically, both of us having the same amount of time, but one of us delivering more work than the other, okay? So that's basically what these two examples are. So the unit of power is a watt, in honor of Mr. James Watt, again, who did a lot of work in these areas too. A kilowatt, which is a typical unit for a power, actually, is a thousand watts, okay? And sometimes you will find the power company delivering the power to you in kilowatt hours. That's not power, I'm sorry, that's energy. Okay, that's how much they, because that's how many kilowatts you consume in an hour. So you multiply that number by uh, 3,600 to get the uh, joules, if you like, if you want to get it in joules. A job can be done slowly or quickly. Both may require the same amount of work, but different amounts of what? A job can be done slowly or quickly. So it's the same job. So in this case, it's the same energy. We don't know anything about momentum in here. Okay. And the answer in this case is power, if it's the same job. Okay. Mechanical energy is due to position or motion. This is usually what is referred to as uh, potential energy, and this is what is referred to as kinetic energy. Potential. Okay, so that's basically the one that is position is the first one, and this one is that of motion. So the potential energy is stored energy in, uh, that can do work for us. The fact that you have the power plug in your house 
doesn't mean that you have work. You will have work only when you plug the device in it, then you're converting that energy into work, okay? Stretch bow, for example, is potential. The minute you let go of it, it's going to convert it to kinetic energy. It does work for you, okay? Same thing with a rubber band, same thing with a string, I mean a spring, same thing with all kinds of things. If you stretch a string or compress it, you release it and it's going to convert that into kinetic energy. It's going to do work for you actually. For example, water, that's exactly how we get our power at home. That's how we got our electrical energy, is having water at a certain height falling. When it falls, it turns the turbine and the turbine basically when it turns, there is, a, there is a magnet inside of it, inside those coils that induces a current and that current is stored in, in, in big batteries that deliver the power for us. So the power that we have right now powering our devices, our computers and phones and all of that was at some point uh, 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 gravitational potential energy due to the fact that the water was sitting at a higher level and when it fell, it converts into electrical power. So again, we're converting it from one form to another, to another, to another, to another. Now it's light coming from the screen, okay? Or stuff like that. So it's, it's different forms of water. So that's basically how we get our power in here. Probably we're getting it through different forms also in Southern California. Maybe some of you probably are, uh, at least maybe they're connected to some sort of a chemical plant that uses, that burns maybe some fuel or diesel or something like that to turn the turbines to do the same thing. If you go to Home Depot, you can buy those power generators, basically, that you can put gasoline in them and they can make electricity for you. So in this case, the one that is due to gravity is M times G times H. That's what I was using all along when I said the 25 kilograms. So the 25 kilograms, times G, which is uh, uh, 10 meter per second per uh, second, times the height, which I roughly approximated to about three meters. So that's the expression for the gravitational potential energy. Since this is due to gravity, okay? There are other kinds, the spring is different. Okay, it's not the same thing. The, the electrical power is different, but this is the case for the gravity, for the case of the water when it falls from a certain height, okay? The higher it falls, the more speed it's going to have. The more it's going to turn the turbine, the more current you're going to have, okay? The more water flows, the faster actually also the same thing happens. So basically that's one or the other. G doesn't change, okay? G is the same all over the earth, more or less. Okay. Does a car hoisted for repairs in a service station have increased potential energy? Yes, now it gained H, it has higher H. Case in point, cut the power source and you will see what happened to it, it's going to fall back, okay? So yes, any object you raise it, it has potential energy. If you drop it, it's going to lose that potential and convert it back to kinetic. So that's where the H comes in. That's where that H is. Again, uh, what matters really is the height. It doesn't matter which way you do it, okay? If the, if the distance is three meters, like I've been giving all, all along examples, the work for the 10 Newton going three meters is going to be 30, 30 joules because 10 Newton is already a weight for you, okay? So don't convert, don't multiply it by, by another 10. You have 10 Newtons times three, so that's 30 joules. 30 joules going straight up or on an incline or in stairs. Both of them you have to dispense of the same amount of energy, which is in, or some amount of work you have to do, which is 30 joules. In your minds, guys, what do you think is easiest? I'm going to give you two scenarios. There's this three plus this one. Oops, I don't mean to make this, this big. This case, okay? This whole distance is just three meters, by the way. Which one is easier for you guys to do? So you have the straight up three meters, pull it up. I would say, or, oh sorry, go ahead. Or an incline with a small inclination. I mean, not small, with a steep inclination, kind of steep a little bit. 
or with the stairs or with a very 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 uh, uh, smooth incline which one is easier I would say smooth incline yes the, the with a very small inclination it's easier isn't it yes because let's say you're, you're going it's easier to go up a hill a slight uh -huh. hill over than doing than going upstairs because you're yeah. going up more vertically using more energy to go up Actually, the energy is going to be the same, Jeffrey. The work is going to be the same. But the point oh. I'm trying to make in here, the incline is actually a simple machine. It makes the same work easier to achieve. There is less effort actually in here. You're fighting less forces. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, was, I think I was going like way ahead okay. on that thing. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm not blaming you. I mean, this is actually good, the, the discussion, because toward the end, you will see that simple machines do not create energy. So basically, you can say it's less energy or more energy. It's the same amount of energy in either of the three cases. And as a matter of fact, even the fourth case I throw in, both all three cases or four cases are 30 joules. Okay, it doesn't matter. So the work is the same. But one of them is a lot easier intuitively than the others, which brings me to the next thing in here, this is not a question of the day, that the incline, because we're talking ahead of our, uh, what we're supposed to be, is another simple machine actually. We just saw two simple machines so far. I mean, we saw the case of the pulley that redirects uh, force and helps you basically achieve the same amount of work. And now we saw another one, which is the incline, helps you do the same amount of work with less effort actually, okay? We'll see what is an effort later on. Basically, what force you have to exert, okay? That's what the effort is. Like another case that we're going to talk about is the lever. Lever, you can lift anything with a lever, provided you have a long enough arm on it, uh, with less force, okay? But the same amount of work. Instead of having to take, for example, an elephant over 10 meters, you probably are going to lift it probably an inch off of the ground with a proper lever, okay? So in this case, it's going to... I mean, because your hand has to move uh, 10 meters in order for it to move an inch. So the amount of work is the same, okay? The amount of work you deliver is the same amount of work that you get out of the simple machine in that case, which is another simple machine in here that we're going to talk about at the end, okay? So those are some of the simple machines that we have in this case. So again, they're giving you an example in here of the incline. I just threw in another example in here. I threw in another example in here with the... Uh, um, the same height, the three meters is the three meters. That's why I was very, very specific on the three meters in here. So that all four cases give you the same amount of, wo of work in this case. All of them result in a mass being at a certain height, now at a newer height. Because if you look at this formula, what matters for it is the height, not anything else, okay? Let me grab it in here to see. What is that formula? Yeah, it, what matters in here is the height, and the height is the net difference between the initial level and the fir first level. So the fact that you go on an incline or up straight up, it's the same amount of work. But the incline is actually a simple machine that makes the job a little easier, okay? So that's basically what it is. I mean, probably if I didn't put in the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, this last example in here, maybe somebody might be tempted with the stairs, and I think some of you already went with it. The reason why it looks easier for you because it's probably, there is an easy way for you to step in and step out because this incline looks steep, okay? And it looks as steep as this one, so probably it's much easier to go through the stairs in this case. But both of them are actually the similar if you can get your hold of your feet on this thing. But this one definitely you can do. Actually, you can do another one that is a mile long and three meters high, okay? You can't even notice that this, there is an incline on this thing at all. You're walking as if you're walking. Of course, you have to walk a lot longer, okay? With less effort, which amounts to the same amount of work at the end of the day, okay? <laughs> That's basically what this thing is. I guess I was just looking at it as uh, if I take a break on an incline, I may have <laughs> yeah. to start all over. <laughs> okay, yeah. I mean, this is one of the things. If you happen to, uh, I mean, see uh, uh, the mount, what is it? Mount... Uh, the biggest mountain in uh, on Mars. Okay, it has a it's a, it's the tallest mountain in the solar system, but it has a very 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 small inclination. As a matter of fact, if you walk it, you would not even notice that you're climbing a mountain. Okay, so you could do it. It takes a long time to do it, as if going from Marseille to uh, Paris, which is in France, which is a long distance. That's exactly how big it is. Actually, the mountain, the entire country of France. 
But at the end, you're going to reach the top of the mountain. When you are on top of the mountain, you wouldn't think that you are on top of the mountain because of its small, basically, uh, inclination. Okay? But it's the tallest mountain in the solar system. As a matter of fact, it's taller than Mount Everest. Okay? So, the kinetic energy is the energy of motion. And uh, I already de defined it earlier, which is one half times the mass times the speed squared. Okay? The speed times speed is the speed squared. So that's how much it is. All of these things so far, whether the potential energy, whether the work, or whether uh, uh, the, the energy, the kinetic energy to be more specific, all of this, they are measured in joules. Okay? Everything is measured in joules. The power, though, is measured in a different unit, which is watts. Watts, which is just a joule per second. Okay, that's what a watt is. So that's the, uh, the, uh, the, this quantity. So if you double the speed now, because you have double it in here and double it in here, it's going to quadruple. Must a car with momentum have kinetic energy? Absolutely. If you have momentum, you have kinetic energy, because momentum is actually m times v. And v is usually, like I said, it's a vector, really. It has a pointing direction. But the fact that it has a speed, which is part of v, it has kinetic energy, OK? Because kinetic energy depends on the speed. If you have it, you have kinetic energy. It's always positive, though, OK? Which makes you wonder when we were doing the collisions before, if you have a, a car that is a ton moving with 50 miles per hour in one direction, another car moving with another 50 miles per direction in the other direction, you have a huge amount of kinetic energy because the kinetic energy doesn't matter which direction the cars are moving. When they collide, all the energy is gone because they stop. So there is no kinetic energy. So where did the energy go? I think we answered it there in terms of heat and in terms of uh, sound, in terms of other forms of energy. Okay. So kinetic energy and work of a moving object equal to the work of bringing it to a standstill. So if an object was moving and now it has zero velocity, so it has an initial velocity, so the amount of work to stop it is equal to that energy that it had before, okay? And again, we're stepping into the work energy theorem at this point because the final kinetic energy is zero the initial kinetic energy is some finite amount. Going from one state to the other is the work, okay? So there is a force that stopped it. And that force did work. And that work is the one that stopped this car, okay? So this is the work energy theorem in its glory. Gain or reduction of energy is the result of work, okay? An equation, work is the change in the kinetic energy. It's very simple, okay? So this was question one that we already had to begin with. How does the force do it? The force will do work to change the kinetic energy of an object. So that's how the secret. So now we know it's secret, okay? So we have learned one of the secrets of life, okay? This is the work energy theorem. And it applies to either increasing or decreasing. Okay, it applies to either uh, doing work against something like the force of friction or having work done like the case of the engine. Okay, so either the energy pumped to the system or re removed from the system. Okay, and here it's telling you. Consider a problem that asks for the distance of an object, a fast-moving crate sliding across a factory floor and then coming to a stop. The most useful equation for solving this problem is not F equals to MA, by the way. Okay? It's not the impulse uh, momentum theorem, too. It's not just the... Uh, uh, the uh, it's not, of course, the kinetic energy by itself is not a theorem. They're just the definition of the kinetic energy. So technically, it's one of these three. Either this one, or this one, or this one, okay? By the way, this three, any of them can solve the problem. 
F equals to MA can be, can do it. The, the impulse, if you know the time of the span and all of that, you should be able to do it too. But actually, as a matter of fact, in this case, because it's easy to find the distance through which it traveled and how much velocity it had before and how much velocity it had after, and then you can solve the problem much faster using this technique than anything else. Whenever time is not involved or asked in problem solving uh, skills, this is the theorem to use actually, okay? Whenever time is specifically asked or impl implicitly asked, then F equals to MA actually your your, your best bet, okay? When there is a potential for mass to change, then it's the other one, B actually. Okay, the work done in bringing a moving car to a stop is the force of tire friction times the stopping distance. If the initial speed of the car is doubled, the stopping distance, okay. Force of friction is a weird thing. You can't really do anything with it, okay? You have to do measurements to find it, okay? I know there are tabulated values and things like that, but at least based on the theories that we have, we don't have enough information to answer this question. So the correct answer is actually D. This is, if you wish, a derivative of the work energy theorem that we just talked about. Law of conservation, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It may be transformed from one form to the another, but the total amount of energy never changes. As a matter of fact, yeah, and this statement looks general, and that's fine, because we're including uh, non-conservative forces in the energy definition itself, but technically the conservation of energy in the context of mechanics is a so-called mechanical energy. Namely, kinetic energy plus potential energy, those are conserved only if there is no friction or no engine. I, I don't mean an engine in the classical se in the sense of a car or anything like that, but no thing to pump energy to the system. It might be manual. You might be, for example, adding energy yourself or a power plug or something like that. So nothing to add energy to the system or take energy from the system, like in the form of friction, usually that's what the culprit is, okay? So if that's the case, this quantity is conserved. In general though, yes, energy never, and we said that, that's one of the laws of nature, okay? So you have potential energy now, if you let go of it, you cut it, it's going to convert that to a kinetic energy. So in this case, the level of your potential was here. The level of your kinetic was zero initially. At the end, the level of your potential now is empty and all of the energy now is kinetic. Okay? And one of the problems that you guys have is uh, the roller coaster problem. The roller coaster problem is an example of energy changing from one form to the other. So basically, let's say for example, this is a typical path for a, uh, a roller coaster. Okay. So at this point, all energy is potential. Okay. So this is the total energy. All of it now is potential. When you are down in here, this is how much potential you're left with. And this is how much kinetic you have. You have a lot of kinetic at this point, okay? Now, when you try to go up, so it's moving fast in here. That's what means kinetic. It has a lot of kinetic. It says it's not moving at all when it's on the top of the, for the, it only has potential. When you let go of it, then it's going to gain and gain. When now it starts to climb, it's going to lose uh, kinetic. So that this is how much kinetic left. And this is how much potential now it has gained. So it's climbing back again. So it gets more energy in this case, okay? So when it arrives at this point, it has less velocity than what it has in here, but it's still moving, okay? Because there is a high difference. It still has motion in it. So it's going to continue now until it converts back to this much kinetic. So it has probably, if this is less than the other one, so it will have more velocity than when it was here. Okay, 
and less potential now. It lost a lot of its potential energy. At that point, it's moving super fast, okay? Of course, we're neglecting friction. If friction is involved, this whole process is diminished with the whole thing. So it can climb again, losing some of its kinetic, because it has this much kinetic to begin with, now it has this much only, and gaining now potential. So there it's basically for the roller coaster problem, that's exactly what's going on. It's an exchange between uh, the, uh, the potential and the kinetic. So where does it have the highest potential? It's in here, okay? Where does it has the lowest potential? It's in here, okay? Where does it have the highest kinetic? It's where it has the lowest potential. Where does it have the, uh, the, the lowest kinetic? It's here, actually, before we start. So that's basically some of the questions. Did you guys see the problem? It's one of the problems that you gave I assigned. It's similar to this question. Provided no friction involved, okay? Friction is involved, this whole thing is a mess. Friction is called the bad boy of physics because it messes up everything for us. You guys understand this question because this is part of your homework assignment, by the way. Yes? Okay, let me redraw this one because probably it's not clear as a hand or go quickly on it. Okay, maybe with the different colors. Okay, so let me use this for potential. This is, pot oops, it's gone, all of it. That's good because I wanted to redraw it anyway. So this is the path. Okay, so initially, this is, can, this is potential. If I let come from rest, I have no kinetic, okay? So if the car starts down uh, the hill from the rest, it has no kinetic whatsoever. It only has potential. And we're letting only gravity do its work, okay? We're not getting anything else involved. We're not, we don't have any motors or anything like that. Then when it comes down, this is how much actually kinetic at that point you have. And this is how much potential you have left with this much. Okay. Now, when it climbs back up, it's going to gain some of that potential, losing some of that kinetic. Let's move fast. Let's move slower, actually, by this point in here. So at this point, it looks like it's moving the fastest compared to this point and the other one. This one was not moving at all, and uh, with the least amount of potential in this case, in this three, uh, there are three points. That makes sense now. Okay, good. Oh, I didn't ask the second question, uh, Taryn. The second question has not been asked yet. It's only the first question. No, there was only... Uh, I'm sorry, the first question is, uh, was only one question we asked today so far, which is the motor for this class and the uh, motor for it is the work energy theorem. Yes? That's it, nothing else. So there was only one question so far. Okay. So the question is, what, how does the force do it? Doing work to change kinetic energy. Okay, that's the question of the day so far. Okay, uh, what time is it, five or three? Oh man, we still how many, we have 20 slides to go through. So I think we understand the conservation and the bow and arrow is similar to that problem. Okay. Except the potential energy in this case is in, this, in, the, in the form of uh, elastic energy inside this, uh, this string, okay? Uh, the difference between momentum and uh, kinetic energy, one of them has direction namely momentum, and the other one doesn't. It's always uh, the same thing. It's always a positive number, as a matter of fact, for the kinetic. Here is a simple machine that I talked about. We already talked about a couple of machines so far. Actually, I mentioned the third one, the lever. So those are some of the things that are good to know. I mean, uh, those are some of the machines that we need to know on a regular basis. Lever, the incline, and also the pulley. Those are the three machines that we deal with. Okay, on a regular basis. And in this case in here, 
the work input that answers the question that was raised in the beginning, basically at some point. Okay. Now this thing is out. Is the input work must be equal to output work. This is the best case scenario, by the way. In typical situations, the work output is usually less than the work input because of losses in the system. So again, uh, this is the load. This is what you want to lift, an elephant, for example, okay? This is the effort. You would want to do very little work, okay? I mean, very little effort, not work. The work is gonna be the same at the end of the day. So if you're required to lift an elephant, for example, one meter, and the elephant, for example, weighs a ton, I don't know how much elephants weigh, honestly. Let's put it to ton, which is a thousand kilograms. So you're looking at about 10,000 newtons. And you want to lift it one meter. So this is 10,000 joules. And you cannot pull more than 100 newtons. That's, that's, that's all you can do, okay? So for you to make up for the 10,000, you have to move, move it 100 meters, okay? Okay. 100 newton is very little force, it's 10 kilograms. Let's put more significant number, 1,000 newtons, okay? 100 pounds, 100, 200 pounds, okay? Let's say, for example, you can do 200 pounds. If you can do 200 pounds, then you move it 10 meters only, okay? So that's basically how this is. So with, with, with lifting 200 pounds, you can lift the elephant, which weighs about a ton, which weighs about 2,000 pounds, 2,000 basically pounds, yes. So that's, that's not a bad deal, isn't it? But instead of the elephant going 10 meters like your arm does, it's only going to go one meter. Okay, so that's basically the trade-off. So the work in this case is the same. So this is the concept of simple machines in general. So this is the pulley. We already talked about that. And this is the redirection still work, okay? So again, this is just checking this concept in here, which should be easy enough. The efficiency is the useful energy output over the total energy input. That is basically what the efficiency is. Again, because as I mentioned before, uh, this is an ideal situation, you get 100% efficiency, but that's not true, okay, in practice. You always lose energy. So a certain machine, what is the question? A certain machine is 30% efficiency. That means the machine will convert 30% of the energy into useful work. 70% is wasted, okay? So that's what the efficiency of the engine is, what the efficiency of the machine is. A, a key note in here is that compound machines are actually, the efficiency of compound machines is the product of the uh, efficiencies of the simple machines they make it. So that's basically how they. Okay, that was only one question for the day. The sources of energy, I already talked about a couple of few, at least in terms of uh, hydro, uh, 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 what are you, uh, the, the power stations using, for example, uh, water and other sources, for example, gasoline and other sources. The source of the energy in the earth entirely is coming from the sun, with the vast majority of the energy consumed on earth. There is a very small fraction of the energy and the earth that is actually consumed, made by the earth itself in form of radioactive form, but everything else that we have on earth is coming from the sun. So this is in a nutshell your chapter. Uh, you're supposed to still go through the book, answer the questions. So there was only one question of the day today, basically, and the question Kyle basically summarized it. How does the force do it? The force does work to change the kinetic energy, okay? To change the kinetic energy. So that's the answer to the day, today's question. The force does work to change kinetic energy, okay? So that's the secret, okay? You know one of the nature secret. If you guys don't have any questions for me, uh, like I said in the beginning, for those who are not here, it's a good idea that they subscribe to the channel. That way they will get the content much faster than uh, uh, than having to wait for it. Yes. I had a question about the homework. Mm -hmm. um, under the submission button, is it like a file? Is it like a text box entry? Or do you want to take like, a picture of all the work with the questions? Because okay, I, I was barely looking at it right now. Okay, you can take a picture of what you did, scan it mm -hmm. if you have a scanner. 
or mm -hmm. with your phone, it's a good idea to reduce the size of the, of the resolution of the phone to the smallest possible value on your phone, okay? Is it like 600 by 800 pixels or I forgot the measurement? Usually it's 640 by 480 if you can do that. by 480, okay. Yeah, 640 by 480 is the smallest possible, I think. On It's called web setting, okay, by 480. That's really the old, uh, it's probably hardly any phone now can do that. I think all phones now, they go with them basically 4,000 by 3,000 pixels or something like that. It's a huge yeah, that's file. When, when, well, yeah, when they upload them, they're, they're huge. Okay, yeah. so 640, okay. If you know software, there is a good software that can uh, reduce the size of the files. If you can have access to it, you don't have to do it. Because if you don't know it, it's a big learning curve on it, and you're going to waste a lot of time on it. So yeah. don't do it. Okay, yeah. that GIMP. If you can, yeah. if if you if you know it, that's a good software to reduce the si yeah. file sizes. Yeah. Basically, you take a picture and you open the picture with GIMP, and you go to uh, I think uh, image or picture or something like that. Yeah, it's a setting. Rescale. And then you rescale. You rescale. Yeah, I you rescale. That, yeah. rescale. And if you choose one, the width to be 640, the other one drops by itself to 480. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was just trying to remember the measurements and like what was the method you wanted to. Yeah, so software. you can upload okay. them as a, as, a, as, a, as a file, a single file or multiple files. Or if you work them in a Word file, you can upload a Word file or a text file or a PDF file or any file you like, okay? Okay, I might think I might just do a Word file. All right. Okay, a word of caution for the pictures, guys. If you're going to upload a picture, make sure uh, it looks fine to you. When you look at the picture, you can read it. Sometimes when you take a picture at a different angle or, or very poor lighting, and you try to read it, you can't see it very carefully. So if I will struggle to see what you mean here and there. And I would have very hard time trying to go through it. So please be kind enough to look at it again after you take the picture or after you upload it to Canvas, look at it again to make sure that it looks fine to you. And if it does look fine to you, then it should look fine to me, okay? But uh, for the sake of the bandwidth, it's a good idea to reduce the size as small as possible that way loads faster on both ends, on your end, and especially on my end when I'm trying to grade these things. Okay. Okay. Yes. No, this is, uh, the question is for the chapter seven uh, discussion. This is chapter seven, no? Kyle? It's not up there? Let me check quickly here. So the answer to the question is on chapter seven, yes. Oh. Oh, for the homework, yes. For the homework is probably, for the assignment for the homework, it's in the, oh, you're talking about this discussion. Okay, go to chapter seven and ch fix chapter seven, then discussion, Kyle, okay? I have a question from the homework. Yes. So for the last question, I was confused. Like, is which it question? The question that says um, that yeah. talked about the the bus, the rock band's tour bus. Are we supposed to like pick a mass or? Okay, hold on. Can you read the question for me because I don't have the book in front of me. Yeah. Do you want me to um, share my screen? Yes, please. Okay. I think it's this one. Oh, so yeah, it's not in the book. Okay, good. So, a rock band's tour mass is, oh, is accelerating away from stop rate when it's a piece of heavy metal. Like, are we supposed to pick a number that goes there? Okay, I think that question I need to revise this. I think it's not uh, complete. I think it's missing the masses for both the bass and the mass of the car, okay? Mm -hmm. I'll fix it, okay? Okay, thank you. I think it's meant to be filling the blank because the answer is supposed to be filling the blank. So I'm going to fix that one so that I think it's coming from problem 53. Do you have the book from problem 53? Uh, I don't have the book. 
Yeah, it's from the book itself. So if you have the book, look at the uh, the question. So that's basically I tried to put it in there. So if not, I will uh, 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 fix this one in here, copying actually the question from the book and put it in there for you guys. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Okay. Uh, I guess I will see you guys on... Uh, what is today anyway? Today's Tuesday. I'll see you Thursday, guys. Bye.